Welcome to Your Strata Property, the podcast for property owners looking for reliable, accurate, and bite sized information from an experienced and authoritative source. To access previous episodes and useful strata tips, go to www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. Hello and welcome. I'm Amanda Farmer and I have with me today Rena Van Alst. Hi, Rena. Hi, Amanda. How are you? Doing very well, thank you. How has your week in Strata been? Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, had a good week actually. Um, nothing unusual to report. So nothing exploded. And nothing blew up. Nothing blew up. Nothing. <laughs> nothing unusual out of the ordinary this week. This week. <laughs> Good, good to hear. We can uh, jump straight into your challenge for this week, Rena. Well, this is definitely a first for me, Amanda. So we had a scheme that we took over and we still didn't have the financial records at the time. We were provided with dribs and drabs over a period of over a month or two, actually over two months, we were getting bits and pieces. And Anyway, so we got the auditor's financial statement for the period ending March, which is their financial year end. But this particular owner was selling and she wanted a Section 184 certificate, the lawyer did. And, of course, we didn't have the current financials because there had been payments made from 1 April till when we got the check on 1 May. And we we were following up and and writing and emailing and the previous manager, you know, to no avail. And Mm -hmm. the last minute he sent us the information and then didn't send everything, so we had to ask again. So, anyway, that's probably a topic for another podcast. So anyway, the owner rang me and said to me, Rena, will I have to delay my settlement? I said, I don't think so. I said, I'm still just waiting for one more thing and hopefully once we get that, we'll be able to issue it. So we did issue it to her and the lawyer at the same time. Then I received an email from the lawyer who didn't do very much. I think we, we sort of asked him. He was involved in a couple of emails just saying, where is it, where is it? And you know, when we'd respond and send emails to the previous managing agent, we'd, we'd just send him a copy so that he knew where we were up to. And the owner had asked us specifically, don't just email me, Rena, please email the my lawyer at the same time. Mm. He said, sure, not a problem at all. So we're keeping them abreast of what was going on. So the settlement's obviously happened. I received the check for the settlement. I received the Section 22 notice to update the new owner's details. And then I received an email from the lawyer saying, well, because you provided this certificate late and because I had the extra work that I had to do, here's a $2,000 bill. Huh. And I don't, he said, that's between you and the other strata management company to work out. You know, you're going to say, oh, it was their fault. But so anyway, so let me just read Section 184 and what it says, because in a sense, you know, you know that what the certificate has to include, but I wasn't really sure of any, you know, what the penalties were for not sending it by a certain time period. So it does say, Amanda, that under Section 184, that the certificate must be provided no later than 14 days after receipt of an application for the certificate. And the maximum penalty is five penalty units. Mm. So I recall the penalty units $110. So that is the maximum is $550. But I didn't, obviously, there was no delay in the settlement because the owner had asked me and she didn't have to do that because we did get it just in time for mm-hmm. the settlement. And I was wondering, Amanda, like, you know, what rights does a lawyer have to send a bill to an owner's corporation um, <laughs> asking for um, money to be paid because he had to do a bit of extra work apparently, or he didn't say a bit. We just, it's just a, there's no explanation of how this figure was calculated, by the way. Yeah. Anyway, and I had gone to the website of this particular lawyer previously, Amanda, and they're actually one of these sort of mobile conveyancing lawyers. Uh-huh. There's no address on the website, just these telephone numbers. And funnily enough, it says that it's fixed price conveyancing. doesn't matter what happens, no matter what Ooh, I love happens, it. no matter what. I love this no matter what. <laughs> The price will not change. And uh-huh. so that's a bit of a side issue. But anyway, I was wondering if you've ever had that ever happen to you before. Uh, no. To answer your question, uh, what right does a lawyer have to invoice the owners corporation in that situation? Uh, and no right is my short answer. Yeah, exactly. What I suppose the lawyer was trying to do is to say, well, because of the uh, lateness of the Section 184 certificate, we have suffered some kind of loss. And when I say we, I don't know if that's the lawyer or that's uh, the lawyer's client. We've Mm. suffered some kind of 
of loss and we think you, the strata manager or the owners corporation, are responsible for that loss and so you should pay us some money. It sounds like that hasn't been articulated at all or very successfully. No. Well, well, I mean, the, the point is the settlement wasn't delayed. And so yes. I know it wasn't as if like, yeah, the owner lost money or the other side had to pay anything extra because they were, had moved out or, I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. there could have been very dire consequences. So the perfect response in that situation is to reply, uh, if you reply at all, and of course um, you don't have to unless you no. want to just be polite and say received, and say, please explain with reference to a relevant law what legal basis you have for demanding this payment from, whether it's you, Strata Central, or whether it's the owner's oh, no, corporation, the owner's I'm corporation. not sure, from the owner's corporation. Please explain. Um, it's not going to be that easy, mate. <laughs> Yeah. to get money out of us yeah. and perhaps forwarding that correspondence where you were communicating with the owner and they said that the matter had settled on time and without too much fuss. Yeah, and also, I mean, the only thing he did was just look at a couple of emails. I mean, there's nothing that was really... Yes. Yeah, you know, we were keeping him informed as, as she had requested. I mean, really, she could have done that herself, but it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It's In a sense, I understood her anguish and her frustration at mm. this situation that she found herself in, but... Mm. Um, Unfortunately, I just think, well, you know, does he have to go to the tribunal? I mean, if it says maximum five penalty points, man. It's oh, that's units. a good point. Yes, you're right. Those penalty units can only be imposed by the tribunal. Uh, yeah, that's exactly. not something so, that a private person can pursue. Yeah, bad luck, buddy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Such is the fixed price model. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, obviously he doesn't know that I looked at his website, but I was actually quite um, amused when I was going to email and go, but no matter what, you said you don't charge any extra. <laughs> you would. You would. <laughs> Doesn't know oh what's hitting him. Anyway. Wrong strata manager today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I wasn't in the mood either. <laughs> yes. Well, if there's any developments on that one, do let us yeah, know. Yeah, I'll keep, keep you posted, posted actually. <laughs> My challenge for this week relates to bylaws and uh, a very interesting question, which has come up a few times. I'm sure you've had it too, Rena. Should a lot owner be allowed to proceed with their renovation work before the bylaw is actually, uh, I'm going to say before the bylaw is resolved, specially resolved at a meeting and before the bylaw is registered? Something I get yeah. asked a lot. You get this one, Rena? Yeah, exactly, man, especially the registration aspect of the bylaw. Yes, because we do, uh, of course, it takes some weeks often to convene a general meeting at which bylaws need to be specially resolved. And then it can take a few more weeks after that before the bylaw is actually registered once the forms are filled in and we've sent them off to land registry services. And our act is very clear that a bylaw has no force or effect until it is registered. Uh, I get asked this question a lot by uh, lot owners as well as committees who are saying, look, we really want to help this person out. They're lovely. We know that they're going to do everything above board. Can we tell them that they can go ahead even though we're not going to have our meeting for another couple of months? I, of course, recite that part of the Act that says, uh, by law, not valid until registered. And uh, if the Owners Corporation does allow this work to proceed, it is doing so at its own risk and it will not be able to enforce any other terms of the bylaw while it's not registered because the bylaw has no effect. So uh, the strict legal approach is is no, um, that the owner shouldn't be allowed to proceed. However, one practical way to deal with uh, an owner who really wants to go ahead and the committee is very, very comfortable that um, not only that the bylaw is going to go through, um, but that there are not going to be any problems with the renovation is to ask the owner to give an undertaking in writing that the owner will comply with the terms of the bylaw during the course of their work, even though that bylaw is not registered. That is goes one step towards uh, protecting the owners corporation it's not a very big step but it's something but the uh, the owners corporation does need to be uh, conscious i suppose rena of the fact that the bylaw might not get passed at the meeting yeah that's what i mean we never allow people to do work unless the bylaw's been passed at least a man i think mm. registration is a separate matter i think most committees are okay with that aspect not being sort of undertaken at the time of yep. renovation. But the problem is that a lot of people, you know, we find that you give them an inch and they take a kilometre. So uh -huh. once you've let them do it and that and you haven't had the bylaw yet presented or even passed, then to me the undertaking is going to be something that you'll have to enforce and then I suppose it gets a bit messy because in a sense the owners corporation had no authority to allow it in the first place. So then how do you say, well, we had an undertaking when mm. really the committee doesn't have that authority in the first place to allow that to happen. So I, I don't really 
I've always advised people, no, they can't do anything until the bylaw has, has been approved because you're right, Amanda, it might go to the meeting and who knows. I mean, maybe there's been a similar situation, the person hasn't complied and that not with that person in particular, but there's been some reasons why the bylaw may not be passed. It may not be, you know, in the favour of the owner's corporation at all and might just feel the owner's sort of biased and towards, you know, their rights and not the owner's corporation having any rights at all. So, yeah, my view is a little bit different, I think, in terms of um, – because I think I've been involved in too many things that have gone wrong even when yes. I've had approval and they just do something totally different. Yes, I have the luxury, I suppose, of not having to then deal with the building on a yeah. day-to-day basis. But indeed, if work's commenced and the bylaw hasn't even gone to the meeting and is not resolved, it's very hard to put the milk back in the bottle and to say, well, you know, that owner now has to undo the work they've done. They have to reinstate the common property. I think what happens in practice is that other owners feel pressured to approve yes, the bylaw. Yes, big pressure, especially when people, um, Amanda are moving in like let's say they've sold and they're moving in they want to renovate I mean I had one example where this owner was doing the same thing she had moved she wanted to renovate the apartment so we held the EGM quite quickly she had the bylaw and then there was an amendment that was put by the owners at the meeting which the owners accepted that the windows had to be of a certain type because from the outside to achieve uniformity mm. there had to be like a distance between the bottom and the top for this long sort of angled window Anyway, of course, when the work was done, that didn't happen. And, you know, the owner said, oh, well, I told my builder and he didn't do it. So, anyway, we got it resolved. But the point is, I mean, you know, had we allowed her to do that in the first place without the bottle, then I think that it was going to be much harder to get it to actually fix it than when the bottle had been passed and mm. uh, registered and everything like you've said, Amanda. So, yeah. Mm. And maybe this comes back to owners and perhaps new owners moving into strata, buying into strata for the first time, being aware that if they do want to carry out works at the property and if they are uh, significant works, then a bylaw is necessary. A bylaw takes time, A, to put together, B, to get before a general meeting and then C, to be registered and to factor in that time. Perhaps you've bought an investment and you want to get a tenant in there quick smart, mm. but you want to do the reno first. That's often a big pressure to bear that into your calculations when you're looking at how you're going to facilitate your loan and, and uh, improve on your investment. Make sure you're aware that it's going to take some weeks to get things through that process of the owner's corporation approval. And I think if the expectation is not there that things can just happen quickly, mm. then uh, you end up with more relaxed owners, more relaxed committee and strata manager and lawyer perhaps uh, <laughs> and um, things can flow a little bit more smoothly. So we all, we come back to that issue of education and people understanding what it is to live in and uh, renovate strata. Yeah, and if you want to renovate quickly, just go buy a house. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, even you then. Whatever you want. No one yeah. can tell you to stop you. <laughs> That's right, to an extent, indeed. All right. Now, I think this week, Rena, we have a joint win, which we have yes. recently shared. Do you want to kick that one off? Yeah. So, Amanda and I, just by coincidence, happened to be looking after the same building that um, I took management over just recently. And there was a damages claim that had been submitted by an owner because her apartment had suffered very significant water damage. And as a result, she wasn't able to rent the property out. She had incurred expenses in terms of travel because she didn't live in Sydney. And so when we received it, it was sort of like in that very critical stage. And it was lucky that Amanda happened to be the lawyer acting for the Anders Corporation. And I'll pass now on to you, Amanda. <laughs> yes. So this is a building that I had been working with for a little while before Rena came on board. And I too was very pleased to hear that uh, Rena was coming on board. And and it had reached the stage, unfortunately, where the lot owner had commenced proceedings in the local court seeking an amount of money from the owner's corporation. And uh, we're chalking this up to a win because we uh, both sides agreed to set aside half a day to have a roundtable conference to discuss these issues. We had lawyers present, committee members, and of course the lot owner in question who was making the claim. We didn't have a uh, private mediator. We thought we'd give it a try and see if we could settle it ourselves. And we spent a good few hours discussing uh, the merits of the claim, uh, the reasons why we thought maybe the lot owner was asking for a bit more than she would ultimately get in court, uh, what the benefits were to settling without having to go through the court process. And we ended up each side agreeing on a figure that they could live with, that the owner's corporation would pay to the lot owner in settlement of her damages claim. And we were able to wrap that up without the need for any more litigation and uh, enter into a 
deed of release, money paid, owners corporation released and everybody uh, off and uh, focusing on other more exciting things. So a win for that building. I know that committee was happy to have that out of their hair and uh, not an unusual way, at least in my experience, is the way I like to run cases uh, to resolve these kinds of matters. Uh, I think where the common property hasn't been repaired and maintained perhaps uh, as promptly as it should have been and an owner's corporation and a lot owner has suffered loss, then it's usually a pretty clear cut case that there should be some money heading that lot owner's way and a good idea to settle that before too much money is spent on legal fees. Yes, that was a good outcome, Amanda, but I think we need to add a little bit more information as the committee wasn't really aware of the extent of the damage. It had not been communicated by their managing agent, Mm. so that's obviously been looked at in a a separate issue, but I think that unfortunately when owners' corporations aren't aware of what's going on because the owner's communicating with the agent and that's not being passed on, then unfortunately this is the cost that you pay mm. when you don't have a good strata manager, unfortunately. Yeah, there was a bit of a communication breakdown there and where you're dealing with water penetration mm. and continuing damage, these things do need to be dealt with quickly. And that lot owner's claim was racking up week by week because it was an investment property, it was a loss of rent claim. And uh, you're right, when I went to look at the records, there seemed to be be a, uh, a problem at the strata manager's end where communications just weren't passed on and the mm. committee, you know, we all got other things to do. We got jobs, lives, and um, we don't always have our head in what's happening within our strata scheme and we do really rely heavily on our good strata managers to keep us up to date and make sure that important items are flagged as such mm. and we're told deal. you need to deal with this urgently because this is the potential consequence. So good reminder yeah. there for managers too. Yep, definitely Amanda. All right. Well, I think that might be about it for today. Time to wrap up for another week. Yeah, it sounds wonderful, Amanda. (laughs) Enjoy the rest of your week, Rena, and I I shall catch you next time. Bye, Amanda. Thank you for listening to Your Strata Property, the podcast which consistently delivers to property owners reliable and accurate information about their strata property. You can access all the information below this episode via the show notes at www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. You can also ask questions in the comments section, which Amanda will answer in her upcoming episodes. How can Amanda help you today?